located and as you can see as far as North Carolina goes we we have we're leading the way in the number and uh, pretty much have one of the largest concentrations among the southeast major employers uh, 2018 numbers I looked at the 2019 I hadn't had a chance to update them but they're, they're relatively unchanged this is MSA level data as well as far as our principal taxpayers are concerned um, last year there was uh, if you added the totals together you would you'd come out with 6.5 percent this year if you're adding all 10 of them up it comes out to 6.3 percent it shows us the uh, as the county grows we're becoming more diverse in our tax base less dependent on these very large companies which should help us out in terms of foreign firms we've seen a notable 8.3 percent increase um, last year I think the increase was less than about three percent um, from this one I really wanted to point out uh, China because um, last year when, the, when we when was talking about the tariffs uh, uh, I'd stated that you know companies responding to tariffs may you know may move locations to avoid them with the Chinese firms um, in 2017 there was 27 2018 27 and then in 2019 that number jumped to 39 that's a 44 percent increase and also last year I talked a little bit about the uh, Charlotte International Airport uh, they're doing a major renovation till 2025 and you know it's, it's one of the big drivers of uh, economic activity within the area the state of aviation report showed that it contributes 23 billion annually and 1.1 billion in uh, state and local taxes. And let me just double check something. Okay. All right. So now we're going to move on to the portion where we start talking about the actual forecast. Compared to last year, we're at a much better place than, than we started uh, the previous year in. A lot of the factors remain the same, but have only really gotten uh, improved. Uh, unemployment's still low. Uh, wages are increasing. You still have low levels of inflation. That consumer sentiment levels are high. Uh, of course, we still have the headwinds of the Tax and Job Act. And then just recently passed was the uh, phase one of the U.S.-China trade agreement. And then also yesterday there was the signing of the U.S. Mexico Canada agreement, which will you know further um, take out some of the uncertainties amongst trade. Some of the negative factors that we have: uh, the world economy is still uh, slightly slow. We have flat growth coming from the U.K., Japan, and EU. Uh, China is still feeling the effects of the tariffs and are, are declining. And then of course now you have the coronavirus, which is affecting them as well, which will probably only further uh, decelerate that economy. Um, some of the positives uh, worldwide, there are emerging markets in India. They're doing pretty well. Uh, other negative factors would be the election volatility. Depending on it, who it appears is going to get a, uh, is going to take the presidency, it can really alter the course of the economy. Uh, so uh, expect to hear swings all throughout the year, depending on who is uh, currently in the lead. And then, um, of course, there's the potential for uh, further souring of U.S.-China uh, trade negotiations. And uh, based on the past, that shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone. So we're still in the uh, late upswing stage of the uh, economic cycle. Uh, not much has changed there since last year. Like I said, overall, we're actually in a better better position. As far as the Fed's concerned, um, their rates right now are at 1.5 to 1.75. They met the other day, uh, remained and, and kept rates flat. Uh, the charts shown are from the December meeting. As you see, around June, they started to uh, to cut the uh, Fed funds rate. And the chart on the right is the uh, is the uh, dot plot, which shows uh, the consensus of where they think rates are going into the future. And as you see, for 2020, most every one of them uh, said that uh, the current where the current level is about where we should be. 
um, and then even moving into 21, that's when we start to see some slight increases. Um, some of the changes, though, from yesterday, from December, was uh, they still characterized the labor market as, as solid, but instead of saying strong consumer spending, they've kind of downgraded that. Now they're saying moderate. For GDP, um, numbers come in yesterday. Fourth quarter grew at a 2.1%. Um, for the year, we closed out 2019 at 2.3%, um, expecting 2.1 for next year and in 2021, 2.3%. A lot of this will be from the uh, U.S.-China trade agreement, which is going to add to our exports, which will uh, kind of boost GDP in, in, the, in 21 especially. Um, GDP at a, at, a, at a county level, um, the larger your county is, the, the more, uh, I guess, the better off that, that, that they're growing. Um, in counties with a population of over one million people, 96.4% of those counties show GDP growth. If you compare that to the more rural counties where there's a population of 100,000 or less, only 72.6% of those showed, uh, showed growth. And this is in the current economic environment. As far as, uh, the, as our county goes, um, in comparison with the state and the U.S., we are above both of them. This is, uh, this is nominal GDP here. Uh, see, the number will appear a little bit higher. For jobs, um, from 2017 to 2018, the, the major industry that we added jobs to was the finance and industri insurance industry. Um, a lot of that 3,200 jobs can be contributable to Allstate. If you remember, they announced that they were moving, I think it was 2,250 jobs to the area. Their first year, they were supposed to do 900. So it kind of shows the effects of, that a large company can have on the composition of, of industry employment. The only uh, um, industry that lost ground was wholesale trade, but that's been a long-running trend now for a couple of years. For unemployment rates, we are we are at a very low, you know, hold a very low unemployment rate, 3.2 percent. That compares to 3.4 with the state, 3.3 with the U.S. And really, if you want to find a lower uh, unemployment rate than we're currently experienced, you have to travel back in your time machine to 1969. <laughs> For a total non-farm employment, uh, so in a 25.5% increase from October to uh, uh, October of 13 to 19. I know the, ignore the header, it's bothering me. <laughs> it says 12. <laughs> For average annual wages, the county increased faster than both the uh, state and the nation. Uh, current average annual wages stand at 68,110 as of the third quarter of 2019. Inflation remains low. Uh, it jumped in 2018, then we started having uh, that was right around the time that uh, the trade negotiation or well, the trade disputes started happening. Uh, economy started to decelerate, and then around June, like it said, the uh, Fed started cutting rates. Currently, inflation is still low, and, and unless this breaks to the upside, you likely won't see the Fed move rates um, at all until this happens. For how people feel about the economy, we turn to the University of Michigan's Consumer Sentiment Index. Uh, right now, we're at 99.3. It's the second highest reading of the year. Uh, I want to compare that, though, to January last year, right around the same time. And you see us at dip. If you remember at this time last year, we were in the midst of the longest government shutdown in the history of the U.S. Uh, the trade uh, disputes between China were were really heating up at the time, and it had a lot of people uh, worried. A lot of those now that are, are kind of worked out. We have the we have the phase one agreement, and of course, we're not in a shutdown this year. In terms of uh, median household income, uh, once again surpassing both the state and the U.S. 
Uh, gross taxable sales come in around $24 billion. That's a 52.9% increase since 2013. And I thought this slide was interesting. It's uh, U.S. cities and credit card debt. Uh, shows that Charlotte is in the 66th percentile. Median credit card debt is, falls at $2,761. And I don't know how well you can see it from where you're at, but uh, it, the whole southeast is is much more red than, than the rest of the United States. Uh, this, is, uh, this has caused some credit card companies to start uh, changing their lending standards and tightening their regulations up a bit. Also, there's a change to the FICO credit scores coming around the summer, if you've heard about that. Uh, what that does is it's going to take into to account debt that individuals have, and it if you're paying your credit card off and you have a, you know a, a good credit score currently you'll likely see yours go higher but if you have unsecured debt and such and you may have missed a payment or two that credit score is going to likely drop and which you know can cause further issues for people that are trying to find houses things like that because they rely on credit scores a lot for, to make those determinations for uh, permits and construction, we've seen a 2.1% decline uh, in 2019 from 18 uh, in the amount of permits, but construction value was up 20.6%. Now, what this is from, a lot of it was, two-thirds of it was from commercial building. We've seen a huge uh, uh, just build-out uh, in, in office space and new commercial space. Uh, of the uh, of the 4.9 uh, billion that showed there, 3.5 of it was from commercial building. <coughs> when we look at the residential housing market, uh, you know it's a, it's a healthy market right now. Average house price stands at 341,778 dollars, and closed sales are above. 2018 levels at 20,817 sales for the year. Uh, this is the uh, table that, um, uh, and I, for, uh, for the housing statistics, and I want you to pay attention to the right-hand column. Where I have the green arrows, those are mostly the, uh, they're either going to be price or activity-based things. So new listings, how many is coming on, uh, how many is selling, how fast are it selling. Uh, is going to be in the like the well, let me state that again. So, price activity and the number of homes that are coming and, and selling are are increasing over last year. The only thing that's decreasing is how long it's taken for them to sell, and that price that the person pays at the end is a little bit less than what the, the person was asking for over last year. At the beginning of the year, I had uh, put out a few reports uh, saying that the, it looked like the housing market was starting to slow. And at the time it was, uh, this chart I think kind of best uh, de best describes that. If you look starting around uh, 2018 at that red line, I've tried to uh, take out a lot of the uh, the movement in the, in the blue so that you get a better picture. You'll see that month supply of inventory of housing is just how many this is basically if no new inventory comes on the market, how long before you clear everything off? Uh, that started to rise, and that meant that le like more people, it was taking longer to sell the houses. Um, the price increases wasn't as strong, and it, it looked like uh, you know, the, the overall housing market was going to slow. Then in uh, um, combined with that, too, you had more uh, interest rates rising for homeowners. Then around June, that was when the Fed started cutting rates. We seen the inter, uh, mortgage rates fall, and that spurred housing buying again. And little, the last half of this year kind of uh, really made the difference. Uh, up, if you compare to where we were at in June, it's a completely different story to where we ended up here in December. So looking at it uh, in terms of uh, in you know decades, this is what this this chart here is doing. So the most recent being the far right hand side in blue, and office and retail are measured in square foot. Uh, hotels are measured in rooms, and then you have basically an occupancy measure in uh, residential. And you see that residential is both residential, hotel, 
are, are up considerably. Um, office is, is above what it was last decade. And the only one that's, uh, that's kind of slowed is being retail. And I think a lot of that's contributable to the rise in e-commerce. For our office market space, 3.3 um, million square foot of inventory is currently under construction. 2.5 million square foot was delivered this year. Um, for the average asking rates, we're actually leading the nation in terms of, uh, of how, you know, how fast that these uh, um, office buildings are being able to, to increase their rents. Um, and this is this is not residential, by the way. This is this is um, you know, this is commercial space. There is an 11.2 percent vacancy rate, and a lot of that's contributable to the amount of supply that's been added as quickly as it has. We'll likely see that continue to rise uh, or stay around the same levels until the building activity slows. And where we see most of these uh, of the uh, build out coming is uh, this CBD Uptown, Midtown, South End markets. That's the that's the bulk of it. And I mean, if if you're at the government center and look out the windows, you can see all the cranes. It's it's right there in front of you. That's true. Um, as uh, from the top graph, there is a spike in vacancy in Plaza Midwood Noda. That was due to a. Uh, a recent building that just come online it had very low amount of space there and uh, having one just released it has pushed their vacancy rate up until they can clear that out if we look towards uh, warehouses this is also another uh, very healthy market 1.5 million uh, new space was completed with an additional 3 million under construction vacancy there stands at six percent and uh, there's high demand for uh, warehousing space right now in the county. And a lot of that's contributable to e-commerce and trying to get that last mile delivery locations. Uh, where we're seeing a lot of these come is the, uh, is the southwest and uh, west and northern markets. Uh, when you look at the northwest, east, and central, generally there's, uh, the land there is considerably more costly so it allows for less development there and then finally let's uh, turn our attention to renters uh, from this chart here you can see that 56 percent of the homes out there are owner occupied that means the remaining 44 percent are renters um, we look there's an eight percent vacancy rate on the overall housing Look at how fast rent's growing. It's, uh, we're above both the state and the nation, 2.6% compared to 2.4% for North Carolina. The average two-bedroom apartment is 1,154, and that compares to the nation's rate at 1,192. So I wanted to put our rental prices in perspective. And, you know, because we always talk about how fast they're growing and, and such, but where do we stand on them right now? And I've taken the largest 662 cities I could find from a survey. And if you're wondering where Charlotte is, we're right on the very end. We're 313th there, so right in the middle. Um, from Monica's presentation the other day, she said that the cost of living index is, I think it was 99.4, which means that we're actually below the the U.S. And this this is one chart here that kind of shows that. Now, if I look at it in terms of the largest 20 cities, you'll see that we're 12th. But here's the point of contention. If you look at the growth rate, we're at, uh, at that 2.6% that growth rate is only surpassed by Phoenix and Austin, Texas. It's the rate of these rental growths that's really, uh, that's really causing heartache. It's, uh, the overall amount, though, is comparable to the rest of the nation. Uh, if we look at it, uh, just North Carolina, you'll see that uh, Charlotte's seventh there. But if we looked at it from the lens of a county, you see that Matthews is number one, uh, Pineville's number four, and at least for North Carolina, how, how the trend goes is the, the most expensive places are growing at the fastest rates. Uh, and you, as you can see, that line pretty much 
declines uh, fairly linearly. Any questions? like to look at slide uh, 407. It's on page 257 in our books. Um, so the slide this number... the retail sales. Retail sales. And, and that's the one that also has the median um, income with it as well, right? That's the one that says median household income and gross retail sales. Ah, got it. Okay, I'll get there. My, this clicker is... There it goes. Nope. <laughs> Technical issues. Yeah, I'm pressing the red button and it's happening. <laughs> Leave it to me and not get technology to work. <laughs> it was be working before you got there. <laughs> I break everything. What number did you use? Now I don't even touch it and look at it. <laughs> All right, there we go. That growth rate in retail sales, what is that? That's huge. If you look year over year from, it's from 15, a little bit, what, 16 billion to $24 billion? That's correct. What's driving that? A lot of it would be population too. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at, from 2013, if I go back to the, I don't know if you can flip back to the population graph. You see that we've our population has increased by quite a bit. At the same time, uh, wages have gone up. Uh, it's allowing people to spend a lot more, and uh, people pretty much spend what they get. That's, uh, that, that's the biggest thing. Um, Brandon, can you also talk about e-commerce and Amazon? Yes. Uh, the additional, uh, putting them in there too as, uh, and counting those as uh, part of our taxable retail sales really did help. Uh, I can't remember the year that that, that happened. Uh, does anyone? I think it was about three the years ago the state Center? passed the legislation that basically uh, forced Amazon to start recording uh, state taxes on purchases. And so with the last two years, we've probably seen the big impact of that. And then, of course, other e-commerce uh, companies are going to be following suit with the latest legislation. Do we have any reason to think that next year's rate won't be equally as strong? Uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, Sarah is, gonna, is coming up after me. And I'm asking you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> my so, friend. <laughs> so yes, I, I, I mean there, there's we are seeing uh, we're seeing a lot of strength in in, in the amount of uh, of uh, in sales tax growth. Um, there is there uh, any reason to think it would be less next year? Uh, there's there there are some factors. I will I've put together an analysis on. It. I just can't recall it off the top of my head right now. Can you now. send it to me? I can. Okay. So, so you don't want to you don't want to posit the likelihood that that number would actually go down next year. Uh, we we budgeted a fairly healthy sales tax growth uh, for next year, and it was based on uh, a lot of the trends that we were seeing from the from the past, as well as an overall upbeat economic uh, outlook. Hmm. So Sarah's going to come up and she's going to show you some forecasts for FY21, and that includes a sales tax forecast so you can see what, what she's projecting. Yeah, I would just, I would, you know, what I would like to see on this graph, if you don't mind, if you would just redo it and put the year-over-year -year growth rate on top of that, I think. Okay. And the actual dollar amount, so we could see the, the absolute dollar amount, too. That would be terrific. Sure. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I'm over here. Oh. <laughs> thank you for the presentation. Um, I was, you don't have to go to any slide. I was interested in the, uh, the f increase in foreign businesses. And uh, you didn't say what type of industry or business. I know some of them have done, because I've gone to some of meet the meetings of international at the chamber and things like that. I know some of them were... Um, 
manufacturing, but if there's any way that you could uh, give us, I don't expect you to have it on the top of your head, but could give us information on what industries they are, that would be great. And there's also, um, they get a t some kind of a big um, benefit from doing this so that they can get a green card, um, accessible to a green card. Because I know attorneys that work with international companies and the main reason is they want to get a green card so they start you know, a business here and then they, they it's kind of like it puts them ahead of the line. But if you have any information on that, and if if and I don't know if you can tell from those businesses if they're if that is what they did, I would I would like to know that information. Okay. You know if if, yeah, you, can, uh, if you can. So I got that information from the uh, partnership, and uh, they should have a lot more visibility into the into the companies behind it. So and yes, and also this that you know there are a lot of tax benefits that we don't really hear about and but i i have heard about that one um over the in, in recent years and when you when you talked about uh building permits and i know i have learned that that is an indication um is there any distinguishing between um uh, permits for affordable housing or is it is all residential or apartments are they all bundled together um ebenezer you want to help me out on that one Well, if there's any way, if there's any way you could find out, I mean, if there's not, there's not. But if you could ask to see if there's any, if, if because I've heard developers who do affordable housing, uh, when I have met with them, and they explained to me that you know they couldn't get banks weren't loaning them the money, so they said you know permits for affordable housing are you'll notice they're decreasing because I remember being told that. So anyway, if you could find out, that'd be great. Sure. Or tell me where I can find out. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Lee. Thank you. Let me first say thank you. This helps us to focus on where the money is and where the money will stay. I noticed you did not have Africa on your listings of trading. Do we do any trading with Africa? Uh, I'm sorry, which slide are we referring to? I don't know which slide it was. You had the various countries that we did trading with foreign firms foreign oh foreign, foreign firms, firms uh, let's see so the the companies that are represented there are these are there there are there's an other category at the uh, you know expense of you know listing just random countries and and because you see that any any further one that i'd list would be less than 16 companies uh, i've put all others into an other category so that's where they would fall yes and that is based on retail or what have you this is a, this is a count of foreign firms so this is a let's say company you know nike goes to china they're counted as one firm there are, you know, a company comes here from another country. It's just, it's just a count. All right. Now, ownership to property is decreasing for minorities. Why is that? Um, can, let's see, can you restate the, the question? Ownership of property, oh. value property, it is decreasing where at one time there was a great percentage, but today it's decreasing. Can you help me understand why that pendle is growing so? The reason I'm saying so, we had some speakers to come into our small business consortium and it talked about small businesses and it talked about the economic strength of uh, different groups in the country. And this is where we fall down rather than up. Property was greater owned in the 50s and 60s right. and even 70s. But today, meaning 2018, 17, 18, 19, is decreasing. Why is that? Uh, 
within what's inside Mecklenburg County, a lot of it can be. You're gonna have to speak up, sir. So a lot of it can be contributable to gentrification in in in, in the county level, um, as you know, as 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 places build out, they they'll push out the uh, lower income groups, in which you know in the county it does happen to be a disproportionate number of. Of, uh, of blacks and, and Spanish. Given neighborhoods. Uh, neighborhoods. Uh, uh, they would have to target different neighborhoods to talk about gentrification. That's, that's correct. Um, I had found uh, off the top how, of my head. How do we uh, counteract that? You, the economist, and I tell me what I can go back and tell my people we need to do. Uh, mm -hmm. If you wouldn't mind, I'd, I'd like some time to look into that. And I no, we paid you last month. We may not pay you. This <laughs> <laughs> I just want to provide you the best answer possible. But I'm serious when I ask that question, as it relates to the different neighborhoods that is feeling gentrification greater than others, and on the west side of town, it's greater. Is it because of location? What is it? Cheap property? Or, uh, what? What? And then outside of the state of North Carolina, they are coming into our county and purchasing property. What is that about? Uh, it's um, it's that uh, the it's a lot of it can be contributed to that buying down uh, that uh, uh, Monica had spoke to yesterday, to where. You know, people they they might not be able to get exactly what they want in in one particular neighborhood, so they'll they'll buy down and in, in a lower income neighborhood, tear it down, rebuild it. Uh, so you do have a lot of that going on, um, and you know, it's, a lot of it is just a is a is a factor of the growth that we're experiencing. And but these if that's the case, with, similarly, that would be equity in the process. Uh, when and you when you when you look at the migration patterns, though, uh, you know, a lot of the people that are moving here are highly educated, you know, young young millennials. When and you say highly educated, do you mean four year degrees or uh, associate degrees? I think the the majority of them are coming with uh, with the bachelor degrees, seeking job. Right. But then my next question is, why do we have so many homeless people sitting around, lying around? I guess you can't answer that. I know. Other, you know, what I can say is though the overall poverty level is has been decreasing. Has decreased. Yes, it, through the economic, the current economic cycle. If you look over the past, uh, you know, five ten years, you'll see that poverty levels have decreased with the growth. Uh, I I hear what you're saying, but I don't believe you. Uh -oh. I don't mean that negatively. Don't take it that way, please stop. My next question deals with housing as it relates to rental housing. We keep hearing there is a decrease on housing that people can afford. And that means economics in terms of jobs and salaries. So how do we equate that, that there is a decrease in apartment rentals for people who are just barely making it, what what can we do? Uh, there's, you know, there there uh, there's a there's a few things. Like I guess uh, one would be you're gonna have to speak up, sir. Uh, <laughs> put me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm asking the wrong kind of questions, just tell me, and I. We'll be very quiet for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me let me get a little bit more gather some more information. That'd be good if and, you could get it. Yeah. Get some degree of information for me so I can share that information. If that's all right with you. Sure. Okay. Uh, I think that was it as it relates to rent and uh, uh, African trading. Okay. So the average income in Mecklenburg County for women is less than the average income for men. Am I correct? I didn't have a statistic on that, but I would imagine that would be the case. Why? And that's what national data says, and 
most uh, most of the other so when you when you look through it so I'd, I'd imagine that would fall under the same trend historically in that you are research in economics why do they perceive that men would 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 equate to higher salaries than women doing the same job uh, some, because our hair is longer well what? some studies have, have shown that with inside the same job that the that the that their salaries are the same um, where you see a lot of uh, disparages is, is that men will often take more high-risk jobs which command higher pays hmm. that sounds good <laughs> <laughs> thank you all right <laughs> Commissioner Susan Rogers McDowell thank you mr. chairman um, if you could just go back two slides from this slide yes okay um, I just wanted to, I circled on here, Mecklenburg County, 5,512 jobs. Um, so the heading for this is major employers. That's correct. Um, and, and I also wanted to, I circled uh, Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools, 18,495 um, employees. And so the reason I'm, I'm highlighting this is because wages matter and the fact that we are you know sort of key players in um, making sure that a lot of people are making a living wage and so um, I think this chart really illustrates really well why it matters that county employees and teachers make uh, you know decent salaries because they are we have large numbers of people in those categories so that was number one um, so I, I found that slide really interesting um, and then on the next slide um, this has our principal taxpayers for 2019 and I have two two questions one I want to make sure I'm understanding that second column where it says percentage of total assessed valuation um, does that mean the percentage of our entire um, the whole county's assessed valuation it does okay so that's so if you take the first one Duke Energy is 2% of our total Correct. okay and I would be really interested to see how much tax, you know, like a dollar figure beside those, that whole list, um, to see how much, you know, that represents for, um, for our tax base. Okay, okay, uh, I can, uh, yeah, I can look into that. And then uh, on the uh, previous point, let me reiterate too that the the graph here, the, or the chart here shown is um, is MSA level data if we strip out everything from all the other counties that are included in the MSA you can see that Charlotte Mecklenburg schools and both Mecklenburg County would make a much larger percentage and you know, to that number what sorry what is MSA um, metropolitan statistical area is a collection of you know counties that that basically uh, there's there's a few with the North Carolina like uh, there's Charlotte and it's one and there's Hickory's and it's just a, a large collection of counties that are grouped together okay okay thank you the city they have less numbers Okay. That, that was well, they have a question. Let me let me ask you. Thank you. I see Harris Teeter, and I see Walmart stores. As it relates to when you talk about the food desert, I'm looking at the major uh, employees in those two sites. Who the high high paying people? I live next door to Harris Teeter. Thank you. Very happy. Okay. All right. If there are no other questions, thank you so much. Uh, we'll move to our next presentation. You're recognizing Chief Finance Officer Sarah Cunningham.
All right. Dara? <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, didn't want to start off real quick with just a gentle reminder. Is that, how's that? Is that better? Yes. Yeah, um, I apologize. I had a little bit of an incident in my kitchen yesterday, so my voice isn't as loud. So please let me know if you can't hear me. Um, yeah, you should not microwave. Uh, nochi, just a little Speak thing. Speak into the mic, yes. please. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I'll make sure I'm loud enough. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to make sure that folks knew that we have passed out these. It's our 2019 CAFR. So a lot of the data that we'll be talking about today and some of the background material, including some of the things you heard just now from our economist, Brandon Simmons, are all included in here. So we'll be able to give you backup data from things that you can go reference later. So these should have been delivered to your offices admin, last month. The little book that you should have held up? Yep, this is the book that should have been delivered to your office last month. Just so when you look for the orange cover for follow-up, we'll be able to point you to those places. All right. And I'd also like to take a quick chance to thank we have a fellow from UNC Charlotte's MPA program, James Grinstaff. He is with us today and he helped pull together this information and he's working on a lot of our financial data reporting that we're trying to put out, including some dashboards and things like that on various parts of our financial data. Now, is he a senior at UNCC? He is in our, the Master of Public Administration Graduate School program. I so he is our he's fellow. Somebody's job, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you have to wear a tie, Yes. yes. All right. So what we're going to go over today for the uh, financial update and forecast, we're going to start off with a little bit of context. You heard a lot of this great stuff from our economist, Brandon Simmons, and also from Dr. Monica Allen yesterday. It's the demographic and economic data that really underlie our financial results and our forecasts going forward. Then we'll go over fiscal year 2019 results and review, fiscal year 20, our current status and our expectations for the rest of the fiscal year. We'll invite Ken Joyner, our esteemed assessor, to come talk a little bit about our assessed values going into 20 and 2021, and then close with our fiscal year 21 revenues forecast. Okay, so just to start off, the county, as you've heard from uh, Brandon Simmons, we do have a strong economic base. Just a few statistics that folks haven't mentioned already. Per the U.S. Department of Commerce, Mecklenburg County is the fastest growing large economy and is structured to attract and retain jobs. Mecklenburg County is the number two financial center in the United States. It's also going to be the new home for Truist. New business investments in Mecklenburg County show that we're more than just a financial center, with a variety of businesses investing in the county, including the Fortune 100 company Honeywell recently. Mecklenburg, as you've heard, is a major technology center. One key point is Charlotte is adding tech jobs at a faster rate than Raleigh did last year. That's good. It, it, yes, we, uh, last year was, I think, the first time that we'd seen the data that we'd overtake in Raleigh and new tech jobs. So Charlotte Region has about 53,000 high-tech jobs, and with recent announcements of more coming, about 3,100 from Lowe's, Cognizant, and Avid Exchange, it'll help further close the gap between Mecklenburg County and Wake for the total technology job base that we have. Okay, okay I thought I broke the clicker. There we go. Okay, going into the um, financials, another little bit of context. We do have a strong base with stable economic and population growth. As a result, our county revenues, revenues and expenditures have been increasing over the last 10 years. General government revenues have been up about 29% to $1.7 billion in 2019. General government expenditures increased over 23% over that time period at $1.8 billion in 2019. Some of the things we were able to accomplish with this, uh, Commissioner Hardin, you had mentioned the gross retail sales of $23.8 billion is where we landed in the most recent fiscal year. That's about a 30% growth since fiscal year 2015. Huge. Yep, it's huge growth, and it's, uh, we'll go into it a little more detail later. We were able, with these investments, or with this revenue, we were able to invest an additional $9 million in MEC pre-K funding in fiscal year 19, as you heard from Tamika Leslie yesterday. That allowed us to open 33 classrooms and it allowed us to serve over 600 more students. We, as of last year, invested $3,155 per Charlotte Mecklenburg School student. That's an increase of 7% over 2018, and it's 20% increase since 2015. So these are where our investments are going, just to give an idea of the return on investment for 2019. We also borrowed $150 million, and these are bonds to help support the park and recreation and Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools capital projects. 
The 2019 revaluation was successful with our improved valuation processes and systems to support transparency. This helps set the stage for the 2020 budget investments and county priorities that you heard from Michael Bryant yesterday. These investments will generate long-term economic returns, and we were able to do so with less than two cent property tax increase over revenue neutral and strategic use of fund balance. Going into a little bit more detail on fiscal year 2018, general revenue funds by source, overall revenues were solid. The general fund, we earned 1.29 billion or about 1.3 billion, about 4.5% increase over fiscal year 2018. Property taxes were almost half of that increase, up 3.5% over the prior year at 822 million for the general fund. Sales tax revenues were about 4.5% higher than our four fiscal year 2018 totals, at about 199 million for the general fund. Looking at our overall fiscal year 2018 general fund revenues results, Overall revenues came in 3.5% over our final budget. And when I mean say final budget, that means over the year, if we get additional revenues from grants or things like that, we will amend our budget. So we try to do that comparison over any new revenues we get. So we were about 3.5% over that final amended budget. Our property tax collections fell within 1% of our budget estimates. So that shows we're doing a good job of estimating where we think we're going to land on our biggest revenue source. When we look to our sales taxes, they turned out stronger than expected at about four, points, four percentage points, or four percent over budget. Investment income was the largest increase over the budget, and this was due to the higher interest rates that Brandon Simmons had mentioned, due to Federal Reserve interest rate increases that have since been reversed. When we look at our general fund revenues by source, expenditures, I'm sorry, when we look at our general fund expenditures by source, Expenditures were about 1.2 billion for the year for 2019. That's about 58 million or 5% higher than fiscal year 18. Our CMS operating expenditures were about 465 million. We're about 38.2% of total spending. Now this doesn't include debt service. This is just the general fund. So it is the largest part of our operating budget. When we look at our fiscal year 19 general fund expenditures results, Overall expenditures and transfers were about 1.3 billion, or a little less than 6% below the final budget. Spending for several departments was below budget in part due to vacancies. And this is something um, we're expecting to lessen as some of the HR policies and changes and some of the hiring activities get ramped up. When we look at our overall results for the general fund, we finished strong using about 4.6 million of our fund balance to achieve our goals in fiscal year 19. Uh, this is part of the, re the responsible spend down of fund balance that Michael Bryant had mentioned yesterday. So we're making progress in that direction. When we look to our fiscal year 19 debt service fund results, we ended the year with a modest increase in fund balance of about 6.6 .6 million. Our revenues were about 13.4 million over budget. That was primarily due to the higher interest rates and interest earnings on those balances. Expenditures were about 8.2 million or 4% below budget. We also used debt service fund excess balances to be able to help fund our PAYGO. So we transferred about 100 million of that balance to fund our PAYGO capital projects. These are capital projects that have already been approved as part of our CIP. We also transferred about 30 million for deferred maintenance. We did have lower than expected expenditures, as I mentioned, and that's because when we set the fiscal year 2019 budget, we had expected to borrow more than the 150 million we actually borrowed. So when we came to debt service, it was lower. Looking at the fiscal year 2019 results for combined fund balance, our combined fund balance for 2019, the debt service fund with the general fund, was about 732 million as of June 30th. Now, the vast majority of this it was restricted or committed. That means we cannot use or appropriate these funds for any other purpose. That constituted 473 million of the total. That includes things like what we set aside for our fiscal year 20 fund balance appropriations and amounts that are reserved for debt service in the debt service fund. We had a total unassigned balance in the general fund of about 259 million. Now, to kind of put that number into a little bit more context, this is unassigned, which means it was not already committed for a specific purpose. 
but it is something where we do have anticipation for using some of those cash flows to pay bills that we've already signed up to as time goes forward. One of the ways to also think about that number is when we look at the unassigned balance, that is about 20%, 18 to 20% of our general fund operating budget for fiscal year 19 and then looking at fiscal year 2020. So that result, if you kind of do the math, it's about two and a half months of operating expenditures would be covered by that reserve balance that is not assigned. Right. Looking at our county investments as of June 30th, the county actively manages all the cash flows coming in and out of the county because we want to be able to both invest and maximize what interest we earn on money we don't need today. We also want to make sure we maintain liquidity and we compare bills like paychecks. So as part of that, we're allowed to invest in certain types of instruments, but we're very restricted. Most of the instruments have to be things like AAA credit rated. They have to be backed by the federal government or by the state of North Carolina or otherwise um, very, very safe and very, very liquid so that we could sell them quickly and be able to use those as, as needs arise. Our daily investment balances on average are about 1.2 to 1.4 billion. When you look at that on a per capita basis for 2019, that's about $1,075 to $1,250 per, per person in Mecklenburg County. Just kind of take a big number and put it into a little more context. When we look at the county debt side, county debt as of 630 totaled $1.478 billion. The county direct debt, I'm sorry, million dollars. I came from the federal government. It takes me a while sometimes to get my billions and billions straight. And we had about $1.47 billion of debt outstanding as of the end of fiscal year 19. The net bonded debt was about 1.1% of the assessed value, which is below the statutory maximum of 8%. Now that 8% is as high as you can go. The 1.1% is in line with what credit rating agencies look at to show our strong fiscal stewardship underlying our, our AAA credit rating. Looking at our debt balance history, just to put this in context a little bit, the county has been working to make sure that our total overall debt stays within reasonable and sustainable levels. In 2009, we were at about 2.2 billion total outstanding. Mm -hmm. Now when you consider what we had in the fund balances at that time and revenues we were getting in, especially as part of the financial crisis, that was an unsustainable level. So over that time period, the county went on a debt diet to bring our debt to a more reasonable and current level about 1.5 billion. Now we do expect that debt amount to go up over the next couple of years, as we still have about 715 million of Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools bond authority that we expect to issue over the coming years as we complete the current CIP. Okay. Looking at some of our other debt management policy metrics, the county is performing well. We ended fiscal year 2019 within our thresholds. And like I said in the previous slide, while we do expect to go a little bit higher, then we are in fiscal year 19 as we go into 2020, it's still going to be within our thresholds for strong debt management. And we wanted to give some comparisons of Mecklenburg County with our peers within North Carolina, just to show how we stack up. Now we are performing in line or better than the next four largest counties in North Carolina using these metrics. We also want to take a look, wanted to take a look at how do we compare against other large counties in Maryland, in Virginia, in Georgia. Now these are not gonna be apples to apples number, but they just give a little bit of context. We're still performing in line or better than our peers in these areas. It's hard to compare the numbers one for one because the requirements are different in each state. You know, for example, we are financing our school's capital. So that counts against our debt metrics where it may not be accounted for the same way in those counties, but we're still performing strong. Okay. And with that, we're ready to go into fiscal year 20. And I wanted to give a, a high-level overview of how revenues have been trending since 2016. We went from about $1.51 billion in total revenues in 2016 to $1.68 billion in 2020. Now, the composition of our revenues is in line with what we saw for fiscal year 19. That's been pretty steady over time. About two-thirds of our revenues come from property taxes, and about 15 to 16% come from sales taxes. 
when we look at the expenditure side by core service, we see a similar trend, going from about 1.35 billion in fiscal year 2016 to about 1.6 billion expected for 2020. Similarly, the composition of expenditures is also in line with what we see on the revenue side with most of the expenditures for Charlotte Mecklenburg schools. Mm. Now going into a little bit more detail on the sales tax and county share. We wanted to show the, uh, how we are getting higher revenues, but one thing to keep in mind, when we have the sales tax and retail sales within Mecklenburg County, we have to share those sales tax revenues and distribute them with the municipalities. So when you look at our overall growth rate from 2014, for sales tax, we had an average growth rate of about 5.75% since 2014. Cumulatively, that's about a 78% growth rate, to answer your question from earlier. Now, when we, that's the part that goes to the entire county. When we look at the piece that Mecklenburg County gets to keep as revenues, we're still growing, but at a slower rate which means we are distributing more to our municipal partners of the growth, but we're still receiving a strong amount of growth. Okay. Now, when we look at fiscal year 20 for the growth in our tax base, we have strong natural property tax growth, and that's a reflection of the growing population and the increasing property values. Our split between residential and commercial for fiscal year 2020 is about 57% to 43%. Taking a look at our current property tax collections. Now, as of the date of this slide, we, it looked like we were collecting property taxes slightly slower than we had in the past at about 67 percentage points or per collections versus 69 percent. So it looked like we were collecting at a slower rate. However, many of our property tax bills were due in the first week of January. So when we look at it, the data a couple weeks later, we're caught up and we're pretty much neck and neck with performance as of last year. When you look at our property tax collections overall, total property tax collections are expected to be about $1.1 uh, $1 billion, or about $74.3 million over fiscal year 2019. We expect that 2020 final amounts will be within about 1.3% of what we budgeted, although we're continuing to watch appeals. So not all of the appeals have gone through the process, and that may be that number is subject to change. When we look at our sales tax collections for 2020, we're performing on pace based on the first three months of data. Now, one thing to keep in mind, again, with sales tax is we don't get the, the sales tax until three months after it's collected. So we don't have six months of data for fiscal year 20. We're working with about three months of data. But based on this, we do expect a higher growth in sales tax than we had budgeted for for 2020 by about 1.8%. One other thing to keep in mind for re with sales tax is the refunds. Now, we talked about this a little bit last year, but just to refresh folks' memory, when there's sales tax refunds, we have no idea, nor can we find out, what year the refund is really for. So if somebody's getting a refund on their sales taxes, it just gets counted against our total. So other municipal governments, um, for CATS construction, things like that, they can apply to the state for a refund of sales taxes that they paid just like we can apply for refunds of our sales taxes we paid. But we're not able to predict that or project it because we get no data on what refunds we're actually getting netted against our gross collections. Okay. When we look to the 2020 year end for the general fund revenues, we expect the revenues to be higher than budget by about 46 million or 3.4% higher. Now looking at just the total county dollar amount, these are our property taxes, sales taxes, and investment income. We expect this to be about 2.1% or 23.4 million over what we had originally budgeted. Looking at the 20 forecast for general fund expenditures, we expect a total of about 1.4 billion or 99% of the amended budget. This reflects the department's efforts to hire and implement programs. When we look at our fiscal year 2020 revised forecast and our debt service fund, debt service and revenues are projected to be slightly higher than budget by about 4.5 million or 1.4%. Looking at the revised forecast for our debt service fund expenditures, with transfers, we're expected to be about 4% below budget. Now, the difference with budget is, again, due to um, anticipating in the 2020 budget that we would be borrowing more 
than we actually did back in September. So in September, we borrowed 200 million. We thought we were gonna do more when we were planning the budget earlier in the year. When we look at the overall 2020 fund balance projection, combined with the general fund and the debt service fund, we expect a net change in combined fund balance of about $10 million. So we're expecting to use about $28 million of general fund balance. So seeing that overall balance go down in the general fund. And we're expecting to see a 17.7 million increase in the debt service fund balance, in part because of higher than expected revenues compared with the lower the projected expenditures. The combined fund balance would be about 721.6 million. And if we look at this from an unassigned fund balance and we're projecting based on our past experience, we're expecting our unassigned fund balance to be about 250 million or about nine or 10 million below where we, are at the, where, where we were at the end of fiscal year 2019. Okay. And with that, I'd like to call Ken Joyner to talk about our assessed values. Thank you, Sarah. Members of the board, executive team, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, it's always a pleasure to be a part of the retreat. Um, we have gone over the numbers for a number of years now, and it was suggested that we go back as we start this, go back through the categories and just remind everybody what type of property falls into each of the categories. So on the real estate, this includes all of our um, land and improvements, including your residential, commercial, single family, multifamily, office properties, warehouses, industrial, and the such. Our personal property is actually a combination of both individual personal property and business personal property that's taxable. Your individual ends up being your manufactured homes boats, aircraft that are outside of our airlines, um, unregistered motor vehicles, travel trailers, campers, RVs, things such as that. While our business personal property is going to be our machinery and equipment, furniture and fixtures, computer equipment, uh, leasehold improvements, and farm equipment are your typical type of items that fall into the business personal property. Our motor vehicles that ends up being the tag and tax program that's administered by the Department of Motor Vehicles on a monthly basis for each of our citizens with their registered motor vehicles. Um, that, that also includes uh, trailers, camper trailers, motorcycles, um, international registration plates. So it's not just your typical car or truck. And then the state certifications these are the properties that are assessed by the North Carolina Department of Revenue, um, typically going to be your airlines, bus lines, motor freight, uh, communication, both landlines and wireless cell towers, gas lines, pipelines, power companies, solar and railroad. And if you'll remember back on uh, Mr. Simmons' presentation, he was talking about Duke Energy up there at the top most of their property is going to be assessed through that state certification program. So as everyone is well aware, FY20 has been our revaluation year. And as we were a year ago trying to project where we thought the tax base would be um, post reval, we had a total assessment of 183.35 billion broken out across the four categories. Looking at real estate, the budget was 157.3. Right now, as we are still tracking appeals, we are projecting that to come out somewhere close to 158.4, so slightly higher than our original projections. Personal property, been a very strong year in personal property. We projected at 10.7. It's, looking, it's come in at 11.5. Our motor vehicles, we were pretty close on that at 10.1 billion, coming in at around 10.3 is where we project that to fall, because again, that being a monthly program, 
We actually, until we get through with the month of June and into July, we are still working on that FY20. And then the state certifications, we were at 5.1, um, and it came in at around 5.2. So again, pretty close there on our projection. So looking at the, um, the actuals, we came in at around 2.1% above the budget for FY20. Now as you look at our estimate for FY21, we are projecting the real estate to come in at around 161.4 billion for FY21. Personal property, we've got that at around 11.65. You have to understand in the FY20 actuals, there was a significant amount of discoveries that were done for back years as part of our audit program. We do not expect those to be at the same level every year. So the reason it looks like there's a small increase there is we backed off to what we would expect a typical year to look like in those types of categories. On motor vehicles, um, we've got that at around 11 billion for next year. And then the state certifications at right under 5.3 billion or 189.4 billion total or about 3.3% growth over last year's budget. So that is the assessed valuations and I know within the program we will wait for questions until the end so I will pass it back off to my colleague Sarah. So to kind of give an overview of where we're going to end off, we want to give you uh, some insight into our trends on our key revenue streams, property taxes, sales taxes, and investment income for the general fund. Sorry, I'm getting a high sign, is that better? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, so going at our fiscal year 21 revenues forecast, we're going to give you an overview of our key revenue streams for the general fund, for property taxes, sales taxes, and investment income. We'll go over our general fund overall revenues and our debt service fund overall revenues. So starting off with property tax. All else equal, we're expecting growth in property tax revenues with the increased assessed values for fiscal year 2021 in line with what Mr. Joyner just presented. Looking to the general fund sales taxes, as outlined last year, we did improve our methodology so we think we were coming closer with our 2020 methodology from the beginning and help close the gap that we were seeing systematically where for years we were seeing, you can tell by the dark blue being a little bit higher than the light blue. There were several years in there where we were budgeting much less than what we we're actually receiving in sales taxes. We're able to help close that gap with better methodology in 2020. And for 2021, we're expecting to continue some reasonably strong sales tax growth we're also expecting somewhat of a bump with 50,000 visitors for the RNC. So we've factored that into our overall growth rate. When we look at our general fund interest earned on investments, now because the Fed has taken action to decrease interest rates three times, we're not expecting to achieve the same kind of returns that we saw in fiscal year 19 or fiscal year 20. But because all of that occurred uh, prior, just the timing of those rate actions, we are expecting the growth to be about $200,000 in 2021 over what we had budgeted for fiscal year 2020. And this assumes that our current rates hold, given reports that it appears the Fed is um, just gonna hold the course for a while. When we look at our 2021 financial forecast for the general fund, we wanted to give you a slide that's really focusing on the county revenue. So the growth rate that could be available for new appropriations. On the property tax side, we're forecasting 920 million in property taxes. For sales taxes, we're expecting 223 million. For investment income, we're projecting 12.8 million. So when we pull it all together, we're expecting total growth in county revenues of 46.4 million in the general fund, or about a 4.2% growth over the fiscal year 2020 budget. Looking at the financial forecast for the general fund revenues overall, 
Now this will include our intergovernmental, things like grants coming from the federal government, from state, from local, our licenses and permits where we're restricted in how we can spend those funds, and similarly charges for services. We're expecting total revenues of about $1.4 billion, or $66 million over the 2020 budget, a 4.8% growth rate. Taking a look at the forecast for the debt service fund revenues, we, uh, we're expecting to land at about $347 million in total revenues for the debt service fund. The, that leads us to about a $19 million growth over fiscal year 2020 budget, or a 5.7% increase. Okay. And with that, we're happy to take any questions. All right, questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For clarity, are we better off today than we were 10 years ago? <laughs> yes. Uh, to what degree? Uh, it depends on how you look at it, but almost every degree. So if you look at what we're spending money on, 10 years ago, we were having to consider and make some pretty drastic cuts because we had to make debt service, even though our revenues were shrinking due to the financial crisis. Right. So when you put everything all together, we were making some pretty tough choices. That's actually one of the reasons that it's good for us to, as we're looking at what our fund balance is, be very responsible about how we consider what that fund balance is and how much we spend <clears> down <throat> so that if there is another recession, we're prepared to be able to withstand it and have a more orderly operation. But at the same time, we don't want to overdo it and hoard money. Because we cannot spend what we do not have. Correct. Amen. So as we generate this budget, we have to remember what our assessment, not assessment, but what we have to pay out versus what comes in. Yes. And do we give that credit to our manager? I would yes, give credit to the manager, but I'll let that be your choice. <laughs> and she didn't tell me to ask that question. All right. So uh, that's a fact. Yeah. Is that right? It is a fact. If you look at things that the actions that were taken, for example, the debt diet that I mentioned, that was something that was done when our county manager had my position, when she was the chief financial officer, to help put us in a stronger place so wow. we could make those smarter, longer term investments, but make sure we were holding to a sustainable fiscal path. So will the minutes reflect that, please, for today? that because of the manager we have. My last question deals with who are we financing the most? What agency do we finance the most? Yep. The, the school system or the court system? The school system is what most of our operating and our capital budget go for. What percentage of our money goes to the school system? Uh, we were at, if you include debt service, it was over 42%. So 42% of our budget goes to the school system. Over 42%, including debt service for fiscal year 19. I can get you the exact figure in a moment. I wrote it down. Thank you. Yep. And, and the reason I'm asking that question as you look for the information mm -hmm. is every time you hear people talk about us having a budget mm -hmm. and hearing, don't forget the teachers, don't forget mm -hmm. the teachers, <clears throat> but the state is responsible for supplying and supporting education, am I right? The state does have responsibilities. There are others that are passed to the county, including the capital budget. Mm -hmm. So we're saying then that we are taking on what we really don't have to take on. I would I would defer to the county manager, but when you look at You're the policies. You're smart, Do you know that? Yeah. I'll, I'll answer for you, Sarah, that, that's correct. We fund yep. far more than we're required to by statute. And I'd like to know what that is, not today, but but because, and the reason I'm asking this, last night on the telephone about 12.15 or 12.30, we were talking about a uh, conference call, some of us talking about what we do and what we do not do and what people are saying that we ought to do versus what we are already doing. So that's why I'm asking that question. And the court system, how much do we support the court system? Uh, the court system is a much smaller proportion, but I can come back with that number. All right, you can yeah. give us that number. So we're yes. not in the percentile of 42% going to the court system. Not even close. Who's responsible for the court system? Overall, I've... Uh, the state. Yeah. The state is responsible for... I'm you are, being you are really smart. Did she get a pay raise? <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Leake. She doesn't want to get in trouble. 
And the reason I'm asking these questions because these are agencies that come to us every year as if we are required to supply and support their programs. So those of us who sit here representing, talking about what we ought to do for the school system without any accountability, we give money where we cannot ask questions. We give money where we have no control. So that's my concern. If we are providing those kinds of resources, we ought to be able to ask something. So as was stated by Mr. Mark Jarrell previously, we need to ask our legislators to do the right thing in, in Raleigh when it comes to education, rather than browbeating us here in Mecklenburg County as it relates to quality of I mean, the amount of money we're paying out for education versus the dividends, which is low in given communities, low performing schools, kids not reading, and we can't do anything about it other than talk about it. So money is not the answer for the Charlotte Mecklenburg school system. Am I right? Uh, I will, right. Um, <laughs> Here you go again. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm speaking Just trying of. to, you know, protect Sarah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> and thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Uh, Susan rodriguez McDowell. Thank you. Um, as far as county debt, um, on that slide, it says um, the net bonded debt was 1.08% of assessed value, well below the statutory maximum of 8%. Um, where, where do we, I know we don't want to be at 8%, but where would a healthy limit, like what's our policy? I know we've talked about this in the past, but this is the kind of stuff that's kind of hard to retain. What, where do we think a healthy place is? Because it seems like there's a huge spread between 1.08 and 8. Yep. yep, there is definitely a huge spread. Now, that statutory limit was something that was set by the state of North Carolina long, long ago. Mm -hmm. So when we talk to them, they're not able to say, here's how you get to 8% or here's what's more reasonable. One of the things that makes that a complex question is you need to look holistically. You can't just look at what is the right amount of debt. You have to look at what do you want to spend on operating budget. You want to look at what are you financing with that debt in terms of new capital investments, and what are the potential operating costs of those new capital investments over time. So for example, if we were to issue more debt and build a lot of buildings that would have operating costs, that would have to factor in. So there's not one right answer. You need to be thinking about what you're borrowing for and how it fits into the overall county goals. Okay. But what we do do is I, I pulled up the slide in the debt management policy. Okay. We went through and in October 2018, we revisited our debt management policy. So we went and we talked with experts. We consulted with the Government Finance Officers Association, and we reviewed our policy at that time against what they had as best practices. And so based on those best practices, we tightened up our policy <clears throat> in terms of what are the different things we want to make sure that we're doing to be strong stewards. We also tightened some of these policy targets so that we were more in line with what was considered strong best practices. So we are looking at a variety of metrics to be able to answer that question. It's also a question that's iterative. So it's going to depend on what your revenue stream looks like, how things are coming in relative to where you're going. So there's other elements you need to be thinking about when answering what's a debt capacity or what's the right level of debt. Okay. Wow. All right. That is that is above my pay grade uh, to you know because what I want to say is you know can we can we speed up some of the things we want to invest in because our our amount of debt is so low you know like schools mm -hmm. land that sort of thing so that was sort of where my question is coming from. Um, and on, uh, let me see, 270. Um, if you'd like, I can go back to that a little bit. So we still have bond authority, which means yeah. we can still issue 719 or 715 million more in bonds for financing our Charlotte Mecklenburg schools. But we don't want to issue the bonds before they're ready to use it for construction. Sure. So that's part of how we time that. So it's when you're looking at the construction process projects, you need to be thinking about what lands available. Yeah who's able to bid on it, what's the capacity of Charlotte Mecklenburg schools to be able to move forward on those projects. Mm -hmm. So not to make it even more complex, but 
these are some of the things that go into our capital improvement plan. <coughs> when we're setting, here's what the size of the plan should be, and then we use that as a base to the extent there's changes that may come along the way, new opportunities, just like we did last year with the additional green, with 30 miles of greenway, and so, so those accelerations. I'm just gonna add a little bit here. So when we do um, set up the capital plan for Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools, we do it on a cash flow basis, right? And so we have spread those projects out over a number of years. And the reason we do that is because we're trying to manage to that ratio right there that says debt service is a percent of operating expenses. So we could issue a billion dollars of debt at one time, but then the amount of money that you would have to take and budget in the general fund to pay that debt service is gonna go up. And then what that does is it crowds out your ability to fund other things. And so this is the process that we put in place to make sure that debt service remains fairly level and it doesn't become an issue in our operating budget. But you know, the board always has the, you know, has the right to say well, we're gonna accelerate school projects, understanding that the amount of money that we would put into the debt service fund, which right now is about $250 million, may have to go up. Mm -hmm. And then that takes away money to fund parks and schools and all the other things that we want to do. So we try to balance that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I, that I just know that in this time of growth, of huge, rapid growth, you know, having this nice, slow, uh, you know, um, this, this process, you know, it just, I wonder if we're responding to our circumstances, you know, appropriately. Well, and that, of course, that's something that the board would have to make a decision about, and it's certainly up to you if you decide you want to accelerate those projects, but then understand that we would have to take more money from our general fund from that $46 million in growth and put that to debt service, which then takes it away from other things. I mean, it's really, it's a balance. You have to figure out what your priority is and, and make the decisions accordingly. Okay, thanks. And then um, another question is um, the unassigned fund balance, okay? Uh, this this is something we we get you know a lot of questions about, and so I really think um, it is helpful for the public to understand as well as you know those of us who you know want to understand how this fund balance works. And so you said there was two hundred and fifty million dollars in unassigned fund because I know there was like mm -hmm. five hundred and six million, but. Yep. The vast majority was already right. assigned. If you look at the second to the last row on that table, you can see the $259 million in unassigned fund balance. What we also tried to do is break out what have we already committed within that $506 million right. in the general fund. So that's uh, the $127 million. That's the state. <coughs> Yikes. Oh. Yikes. <laughs> is everybody okay? Wow. It goes. Okay. Um, so the 200, sorry, uh, for the 127 million, state statute requires that we hold that back and that we can't spend on anything. There's a variety of different types of reasons, but that go, that's the state required statutory reserve we have to keep. When we look at the committed, that those lines, those are the fund balance appropriations that we did for the fiscal year 20 budget for the most part. Some of them came after in terms of amended, um, or for the fiscal year 2019. Some of them were fiscal year 2019 that got moved over. Just to simplify, a lot of those are things where, for example, if we look at the uh, parks, um, the parks would be there under the capital projects, that 38.5 million. Those are the money that we set aside to help advance and accelerate those greenway projects and some of the land purchases. Sarah, Just to give is a it possible example. for us to provide a list of what mm -hmm. is in each of those commitment lines so that you can yep. see exactly what is committed and for what purpose they're committed for? I think yep. that might provide a little more clarity. Yeah, that'd be great. Yep. But, but it was the uncommitted part that I was interested in too. Well, that's, like, but, that's, yep. but I think, yeah. well, it's unassigned, which means it's unassigned, right? So it can be used for, you know, you have to stick to our policy, which is to use it for one-time non-recurring expenses. I mean, that would be our recommendation. Right, but it is unassigned. But there's a but isn't there a portion of that that you know we wouldn't? Well, we have a policy that says you're not going to go below 28 percent of um, of revenue. So I mean, we have to do the calculation. Okay, but that's yeah. total fund balance. That's not unassigned fund balance. Okay, so that'd be great to know yep. that amount. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, we can do that. Mark, Mark, Mark. Thank you. Oh, okay. So, so let me Mark. just ask a couple of straightforward questions, because I've, I've heard this discussion a number of years ask a couple of straightforward questions um, I think what 
the board is interested in knowing <clears throat> is the one question I think you just answered is how much money is unassigned and I want you, their term is just laying in the bank or in the mattress. wherever in the mattress. In the mattress. <laughs> and that number is 225 million 259 million is the amount that's unassigned in the general fund million. as of the end of fiscal year 19. <coughs> All right. Now, the one thing that's not going to capture is any actions we may be taking in fiscal year 20. So that's a point in time snapshot. All right. And so they also need to understand that is that is where we take money to pay capital projects so we don't have to borrow money. That is one potential source. Yes. All right. So you can't spend it both ways. That's what Bill was saying earlier. You can't, can't spend it twice. So you got to know that when you do that, you take from that fund. Mm -hmm. the, the real question and what they're always asking is, how much do we have that's unassigned, that's not committed, that we're not planning to spend no. over and above what we're required to keep on hand? Zero. No, I'm that's what they're trying to find out. <laughs> so, yeah. And you don't have to have that number now, yeah. but that's what they want to know. Okay? Um, now, I'm, I'm interested in um, the growth monies. Okay. And I, as I understand, and I, I don't have these slide numbers because I was just writing down notes. There was $46 million worth of growth. And for the county revenues, yes. For county revenues. Yep. And so what, what they also need to know about that is that when we start planning our budget for next year, you have to understand that last year's cost will eat up money in that, rep, in that column. So, for example, if, if it cost us $500 million to, to, to fund CMS, it may cost us $520 million to do the same thing. That additional $20 million would come out of that $48 million worth of growth. And so ultimately what you would have is um, the county manager will produce a budget and use that growth as a way to find, fund it. And if we collectively come up with other things beyond that, it would generate a tax. And I think those are the numbers that they, they generally want to know. So how'd that do? Did great. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's the bottom line. Okay, yes. You mean? Yes. Like I said, I was on the phone last night. And one person said it was a conference call about some issues about monies and what we were doing. How could the school board change this request we made to build three schools and they cut back on the size of the schools? Do we get our money back or what? Did we know anything about it? No. That was done in July. Why weren't we notified? What happened to the monies they asked for to build those three schools? when they're not building them besides that they, we requested. What do we do? Well, we, I need to follow up on that specifically. Do you have any insight into that, Mr. Chairman? I'll talk to you. What? I'll tell you. My thing is to take them. I want to take them to court. So, so I want to take the school board to court. So what we do know is that when the county appropriated the bond dollars, and as I understood from the, from the uh, from the presentation, there is $716 billion left of what was approved. And so whatever um, the school system does in terms of whether they build schools larger or smaller, the monies that they pull from is from that $716 billion, million dollars that, that has been approved. Correct. I just, I guess I'm just trying to understand yeah. her question about the three schools, and I don't have any information about that. Well, I need we don't to follow up. Anything if they pay less for a school. But I guess I'm what she wants to, to know what is what happens to those dollars if they come in under budget. So that's exactly I think right. Our finance team stays pretty yep. close um, with CMS yep. on how they're spending. And the next so, question is yep. why would they not at least just notify the public? What they're doing. We, I'll follow fun. up on that. Yep. Do you have any answers? Yep. I though, think to we that? do need to follow up on it, but typically we and only pay. I hope the news media is publishing. 
printing yes. this? We pay based on invoices for construction. So CMS sends us their invoices. We don't generally advance them funds for their capital projects. So it would be good to go and understand a little bit more about the situation so that we can follow up more precisely. But that's why I brought it up because we have not been, the public has not been informed mm -hmm. that the school system made that decision. And to me, at least the financier ought to know something about their changes and what they intend to do with the money they're going to save from those three schools. Yeah. When we specifically said what to do with those three schools, one is West Charlotte, Audrey Kell, and the third one I can't think of, but there are three schools. Now I said West Charlotte in my district. Audrey Kale, they're cutting back on, and the school that they plan to build, we plan to build, they plan to build, down by the South Carolina line. What is that called? Palisade. 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 They plan to cut it back. Yeah. And we never said we were doing a substitute school for Olympic High School. Uh, we'll follow up against some Please do, and I'd like to know a response. I hope the news media is printing this. Sir, you may want to share with the board the quarterly meetings that yeah, you have Yes, so as I was CMS. just about to say, we do have quarterly meetings with CMS, so depending on their deliberations, it may be that they're planning on bringing it to us with their next quarterly meeting, which is generally where we're getting the updates, where they would come in with proposed changes to their capital plan that we can then bring to the executive team and the board to understand and, and weigh in on, but it, it would be something that would like if depending on when they talked about it, it would likely come. It was in, in July. Quarterly. It's in their minutes in July. Their minutes in July. In July. Okay. And they didn't want to deal with it because it was election time for school board members. Okay. So we can go back and review those minutes and we'll make sure we can ask about it in the quarterly meeting in addition to the other follow up. I hope they're printing this. I won't go to jail for telling a lie. That's the truth. Okay. I have the minutes right here. All right. Thank you. Uh, let's see where we are. In time. You do have a break on your agenda. Thank you. We have a break. Oh, Thank we're doing you. good. Thank All right. We got a break. About 10 minutes. We'll come Thank back. You. Thank you. Thank you. There's refreshments in the hall. Outside. We don't want time.
Hey, this thing has come in handy today. I didn't have it yesterday. That's what it was. Okay, I'm not getting over that boy dying. Okay, guys, we're in the home stretch. Let's make it run. This is just the beginning. We're in the home stretch of today. Yeah, this is the beginning. Yeah, I'm glad you remind everybody. This is the beginning of the process. Who is that sharp young man up there? It is the beginning of the process. Suit, shirt, and tie. Okay. Yeah, I see. <laughs> We have a lot of people need to sit down. Okay, so we have Adrian Cox uh, to talk about the property tax rate. Oh. Mm. All right, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Adrian Cox. I am the budget manager in the Office of Management and Budget. And I'm here to provide you with information to prepare you for a discussion on the property tax. Okay, the objective of this time on your agenda is to allow the manager to receive feedback from the board regarding the property tax rate for the upcoming year. I'm going to go over some trends in county dollar revenue growth. I'm going to talk about how that money has been used. And then I'm going to go over um, the calculation we use in determining the property tax rate as we balance the budget. And then I have a couple of scenarios for illustrative purposes. I will conclude so that you may shift to your discussion. So to begin with county dollar revenue. This graph shows increases in the budget due to property tax. Um, the property tax makes up 81% of our county dollars. Property taxes increase each year by two primary ways. Either new construction, which I'm showing in the gray, and that is your natural growth, or increases to the rate, which I'm showing in the yellow. In 2019, of course, there were three quarter cent increase, which allowed for 9.6 million in county dollar revenue. And in the current year, the increase of 1.99 cents above the revenue neutral provided 36.2 million. Setting aside increases to the tax rate, um, new construction has increased county revenue by an average of $25.5 million since 2015. And the preliminary estimate as our finance officer has shared for the upcoming year, is 30.6 million in property tax. Undesignated sales tax makes up 15% of <coughs> county dollars. This graph shows annual increase in county dollars from sales tax. On average, sales tax have added 12.6 million in county dollars each year. The preliminary estimate for next year for undesignated sales tax is 15.6 million. And now I will show you these two revenue sources combined. Property tax and sales tax combined make up 96% of your county dollars. Uh, the uh, growth shows the sales tax as well as the natural growth in property tax and the increase due to changes in the rate in 2019 and in 2020. Increase in county dollars have averaged 38 million each year when you exclude increases to the property tax rate. Preliminary estimates for these two revenue sources total to 46.2 million. And now I'm going to shift to expenses. This chart shows the changes in county dollar expenses by three categories. Education, general county services, and our PAYGO and debt service. Since 2015, 61.5% of all new county dollars have been allocated to education, <laughs> averaging $31.45 million per year. Also, since 2015, 35.6% of all new county dollars 
has been allocated to county services and 2.8% has gone to debt service. Now these are the major investments resulting from increases in rate in 2019 and in 2020. Uh, this is by no means a comprehensive list, but just some of the major investments. In 2019, three quarter cent increase allowed for the initiation of our pre-K program. And in 2020, the 1.99 cent over revenue neutral provided funds for such investments as increase to teacher salaries, um, staff to address mental health in our schools, affordable housing initiatives, and 58 new positions for park and recreation. Before I go over some scenarios, I want to share a general calculation that we use to determine the tax rate required to balance the budget. So we begin with our total expenses and we subtract out all other revenue and that tells us the property tax that is needed to balance the budget. Divide that amount by the amount of revenue that one penny of tax would generate and that tells us what our rate that is needed. So for 2020, we, uh, when you take our expenses and net our other revenue, uh, we needed 1.1 billion. The value of a penny is 18.2, and that generated a tax rate of 61.69. Now let's apply a few scenarios. So starting with our current county dollar budget, 1.39 billion. And uh, if I add the estimated 46 million uh, in growth and to sustain services and education, that means you would have a total county budget of 1.4 billion. And at this point in these scenarios, I've made no change to the tax rate. So for a home that's valued at 150,000 at the current rate of 61.69, their monthly cost is $77.11. For property valued at $250,000, that is $128.52. And for the property valued at $350,000, that is $179.93 per month. And so we have a new initiative that costs $18.8 million. That new initiative would have a one cent impact on the tax rate, making the new rate 62.69 cents. For the property valued at 150,000, that would be an increase of $1.25. The property valued at 250,000, that would be $2.08. And the property valued at 350,000, that would be $2.92 per month. So if we did a different initiative that was 28.2 million, that tax impact would be uh, 1.5 cents for a new rate of 63.19 cents. For the property valued at 150,000, that would be a 1.88 cent increase, or I'm sorry, $1.88 per month increase. For the property valued at 250, that would be $3.13 a month. The property valued at 350, that would be $4.38 a month. And now one more uh, scenario. If instead of those, uh, we did an initiative that was 37.6 million, the estimated impact would be two cents and you'd have a rate of 63.69. For the property valued at 150,000, that would be a $2.50 per month increase. The property valued at 250,000, that would be $4.17 per month. And the property valued at 350,000, that would be $5.83 per month. So to conclude, property tax and sales tax make up 96% of your county dollars. And property tax and 
property tax and sales tax combined have averaged 38 million in growth since 2015 when you exclude changes to the rate. The preliminary estimate for revenue growth is 46 million and one cent on the tax is estimated to generate 18.8 million. Uh, and with that, I'll hand it over to the county manager, but I'll be available for any questions. Thank you, Adrian, very much for that. And so we really wanted to put this on the agenda because we wanted to just have a preliminary conversation about, you know, what a what a tax a change in the tax rate would look like if you see the number of 46.2 million of county dollar revenue growth. Um, we consider that to be modest, and that's, let's just say that's before we've scrubbed everything and looked at all of the revenues, and so this is very preliminary. I would consider that very modest revenue growth, and if you look at the fiscal year 20 budget, the year that we're in, um, we actually gave CMS a $46 million increase. And so when you start looking at all the things that we need to do and all the things you want to do and all the things we have to do, um, I need you to start thinking about um, what that means because $46 million is modest and we just had two long days of um, very robust conversations about initiatives and things that we want to do and so I don't know if you have any feedback about this now or you want to think on that um, but we did want to just start getting some sense from you um, about the tax rate and you know what your appetite may be for any changes in the tax rate to be quite candid. Mr. Chairman. Okay, well, I, I, I'll tell you what mine is. Um, I, I don't have an appetite to increase um, the tax rate. What I know you have done historically, and I hope this year will be no different, is that you will look closely at what is funded, and you will have some redirect dollars that we can add to that $46 million. Uh, we will, but we've already, you know, since I've been county manager, we've redirected about $76 million. And so over time, um, the ability to redirect becomes smaller and smaller. And so I just want to put that out there as well. There's yeah. no silver bullet here this year. I just want to make that clear. I got you, but you always say that. No, you, I don't. You come up with, <laughs> you, 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 you know, it's so funny. I learned that from Dumont Clark. No matter what she says, there's some more money somewhere. <laughs> So, so um, I, I think what... Thank you for I, taking this seriously, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> so, so I don't know where you are in that process, uh, but, but as, and I was talking to Mark about this on the break, all of these numbers are preliminary, which means they can change. Mm -hmm. They can decrease or they can increase. But I would much rather we wait till we get closer to budget adoption, and if you move further along in your budget process before we have a real serious conversation about what that means. Mm. I can't even imagine that we, I don't know, maybe just personally, I can't imagine we would increase the tax rate, but. If five votes say yes, we would, for, and yeah, that's my I, point. Yeah, but well, she wanted to know our appetite, so. So tell her that's why I, that's I why I spoke up. Yeah, I don't have an what appetite. I said no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would I would have to concur. I'm not inclined to consider a tax increase, um, regardless of initiative. I I would rather us reprioritize initiatives and make some tough choices on our side than raise taxes. And I and I believe that's what you're. Not what you're saying, but that's, essentially that's, that's what we would have to do. That's part of the message, which yeah. is with modest revenue growth, we're not going to be able to do and not change the tax rate. Then there's, you know, we're going to have to manage within that number. Right. And that precludes us from doing potentially some of the things that we may want to do. So I just want to be able to say that as well. So move not to increase the tax. Okay. I think I heard three All votes. All right. So if there's no further discussion, Move to adjourn. No, we got some That's other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said no other discussion. On that topic. Oh. Let's see. A couple more slides remaining. This is to share with you the uh, proposed agenda for the workshops, as well as the key dates for the budget cycle. So if you will, pull out your uh, calendars so you can uh, check to see if you have any other obligations that you'd like to bring to the manager's attention. 
as we finalize these key dates. So, yeah, I'll switch it, please. It's budget preparation. Yes, sir. Thank you. So here's the proposed public policy workshop agenda. As you all know, as we work through the uh, budget cycle, these uh, list of topics tend to change. And then also we'll take back some of the feedback and discussion that you provided us over the course of this two day retreat. And those items that need to be scheduled for follow up, we'll consider scheduling those items for, across these dates between February the 11th and May 7th, as well as during the manager's report at, the, uh, at your regular meeting. So I'll pause there. I'll give you a chance to look through all the items that we're currently proposing. We already talked about February 11th, which includes the Arts and Science Council coming forward. As I have noted here, it's a topic of interest. Uh, read Charlotte on the 26th. Uh, on March 5th, you'll receive an update on the Republican National Convention regarding our preparation. March 11th, another topic of interest, the equity and inclusion update. On the 17th of March, we will provide you a report out on our community engagement workshops that are scheduled in February, along with other engagement initiatives that are underway. You yeah, also receive a briefing yeah. on the LESD, the Law Enforcement Service District. On the 25th, the sheriff and his team will brief you on the raise the age change. You also received a presentation if, if the manager is considering proposed fee adjustments for next fiscal year. Typically, that's the uh, Louisa agency as well as Park and Recreation primarily. Sometimes the health department may have some as well. So it's just depending on what the department has put in front of the county manager for her consideration. But that is the placeholder for that discussion, as well as you are receiving an update on the department's strategic business plans. On the 14th, uh, the topics for that date is to be determined. On the 28th, you'll receive the budget request from the court officials, as well as CPCC. Mm -hmm. And tentatively, we've scheduled CMS for May 7th. Uh, pending your OK, we'll communicate these dates to CMS and CPCC formally, as well as our partners in the court system. So March, that's the. Uh, I'm sorry, March 5th and March 11th don't make sense. March 5th is a Thursday? That's a regular board meeting. On yeah, I believe that's the Thursday? NACO conference. So the, I think March 5th is a Wednesday. Yes, yeah, a Wednesday. And it follows. It's supposed to be Wednesday. It says Thursday in my. It's a Thursday. In my calendar. Should be Wednesday. So it's the 4th. It is yeah. the 4th. And then the, fourth? the one that you have up there that says March 11th is. Oh, that's a, our joint meeting with Gaston County? What yeah, but however, we coordinated that. I coordinated that with Starla. I believe your joint meeting is in the morning, if I'm not mistaken, Starla? 12 to 3. 12 to 3, and then this workshop. Well, normally, you have, it starts at 2.30, so we'll adjust that start time. Okay. Yeah. So that's also a Wednesday? March 11th, we have that meeting. Our meeting is more important than going to Gastonia. I think they're coming to us, right? Are they coming uh, here, Starla? They're working out the logistics on that. So, Mike, I think March 10th is it Tuesday. I think it's March 10th. It oh, should be March the public 10th. policy. Okay. You know, let us go back and um, yeah. look at the. There's, I think there's some typos on this, Mike. We'll look at that. Thank you. Thank you. Here's the proposed key dates for the uh, budget calendar. And I have highlighted uh, two dates that we've changed. Uh, first one, May 1st, is when the manager is prepared to present her budget to you for consideration. This date is pretty consistent with the date that she released her fiscal year 20 budget. On May 12th is the recommended budget overview. That's when you will receive a detailed overview of her recommendation. Uh, there's no change to that date. And then the public hearing, I believe on, in your um, printout, it says May 7th. That date is being changed to May 13th. And I'll work with the clerk to make sure all these dates is on your calendar. Again, we're sharing them with you for information. And then May 26th and 27th, we're holding those two days.
for the straw vote session. Uh, in the past, we've been able to complete this within one day. However, it is our practice to set aside two dates. And then on June 2nd, at your regular board meeting, you're set to approve the fiscal year 2021 operating budget. So looking to see if there's any conflicts with those dates before we finalize our budget calendar. All right, uh, as I've stated in the past, and I'll state again, at the risk of being accused of being non-transparent, uh, I still want you to communicate with one another. I want you to talk to one another. I want you to send messages to one another because what we're doing is we're preparing to make a decision about the budget. And I know somebody will construe that as uh, backroom deals, uh, but I want to make sure that we have as much collaboration and communication as possible. So now, Ms. Lee, you can make your motion. Move to adjourn. All well, right. Before you accept that, you know, I always end with thanking the folks who assist the manager and myself with planning this retreat. I won't call out all the, the groups of individuals, but certainly I'd like to thank Dr. Dietemeyer and the staff here at the conference center the clerk's office, financial services department, manager's cabinet, our executive team, strategic planning and evaluation. I particularly like to express an appreciation to the PI department, uh, those guys that uh, do all the work behind the curtain, handling the production, uh, those that are here as well as back at the office, uh, the office of management and budget employees. And last but certainly not least, our county manager, I can say publicly, I think I do have the best boss that's out there, so I really appreciate all of your support, Dean, as well. So, thank you. And of course, I, I, I think I can, can safely say on behalf of the board how much we appreciate the time and effort that went into this. It was certainly extremely helpful. And while there was some concern about whether or not uh, we would be able to be as fruitful this year as we were last year, I think everybody can say that, that we accomplished what we needed to. Yes. So thank you again on behalf of the board. You're welcome. Thank you for all of your, uh, your input. It was incredibly valuable. You gave me some very, very good uh, direction. Um, and I think it'll be very helpful for me as I go back and we start to put together this budget for fiscal year 21. So thank you again. Thanks. All right, meeting stands adjourned. Yes.